Um, the uh, the radio mic's gone missing. I don't I don't know why. Probably someone's forgotten to take it off after the lecture. So uh, if you know you hear the sound of someone urinating in the middle of the lecture, uh, that's 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 probably them still wearing the radio mic. It's not me. I promise. Um, today's lecture is uh, it's kind of a linking lecture, which is why there's kind of no practical class uh, attached to it. Uh, and it's a linking lecture between the regression stuff that we've been, uh, or the linear model stuff that we've been doing for most of the, uh, most of the term, and uh, a bunch of stuff on uh, kind of ANOVA or uh, analysing experiments, essentially, that we're moving on to next week. So this is kind of linking the two together uh, to hopefully make that transition uh, a bit easier. So, uh, oh uh, yeah, the, the music was, uh, there's an example about video games, and uh, that was an ACDC song that has video games loosely mentioned in it. It gets more tenuous as the term goes on. Um, so what are our learning outcomes for today? Well, I'm mainly going to talk a bit about, uh, so we've looked at the linear model and we've looked at uh, having one predictor, we've looked at having lots of predictors. But so far, all the predictors that we've had have been continuous variables. So they've been things like advertising budget that's on a nice sort of continuous scale from spending no money at all on advertising to spending lots of money. And we haven't really, uh, well, we haven't at all looked at what happens if you want to put categorical predictors into a linear model. So the first bit of today is really going to be uh, looking at categorical predictors. And um, he just came for the ACDC song. Um, so looking at uh, categorical predictors and that essentially is, is the link to, uh, to all the stuff we're moving on to next week so looking at how you can use categorical predictors in a linear model um, the other thing we're going to look at is uh, something called moderation uh, which obviously I'll explain later but the, the reason for going into this kind of now is again it's a bit of a precursor to some of the stuff we're going to cover later in the module. So uh, as we, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, we're going to move on to sort of quite complicated experimental designs, and we're going to look at lots of what are known as interactions. And so again, this lecture is just, uh, the concept of moderation is really tied in with interaction. So it's, it's, this is all sort of setting, like I say, it's just linking the two halves of the course, if you like. So to begin with, um, I'm starting to regret this example a little bit because uh, I, I spent last night going and watching uh, my favourite soccer team get hammered at home. Uh, very late night and you don't mind a late night when you come back all victorious but uh, when you get tonked uh, and you know, you're know you getting the train back to Brighton at 11 o'clock, you kind of feel a bit miffed. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if I look depressed during this example, it's not that I don't like elephants, it's just that I don't like football at the moment. But it's a football related example. The cheery song! This particular elephant, he gets paid like £200,000 a week. Uh, now, I'm sure in reality, elephant football is probably hideously cruel and they, and, and well, I, I dread to think what goes on behind the scenes, but uh, it is quite cute watching elephants kicking a ball around. Um, now, elephant football is quite a big deal in some, uh, well, as you saw, you know, there were crowds of plenty watching the elephants, but there's also massive rivalry between uh, Asian and African elephants. Uh, as you may know, you know, African and Asian elephants are quite different to each other, they have different size ears slightly different appearance. Uh, I, th I seem to remember reading something that their mouths were a bit different or something. And, um, you know, obviously from different continents as well. So uh, just like in, in the sort of human World Cup of football, where there's great rivalries amongst different countries and different continents, the same is true of elephant football. And uh, it all kicked off about uh, two or three years ago when... You know how like, the, the, you know, the presidents of these big organisations, they always put their foot in it, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the head of the Asian uh, Elephant Football Association, uh, because he's an elephant, he had a particularly big foot that he could uh, put into it. 
And he, uh, in a press conference, he made this claim that Asian elephants were better than African elephants at football. So, uh, you know, I, I don't have the video clip of it, but, you know, he's in the conference with his trunk. He went, Asian elephants are better than African ones. Is that what elephants do? I'm not really sure. Uh, and of course, you can imagine the African elephants were really miffed about this, you know, because they, they were like, no, no, we're better. So the, the head of the African uh, Elephant Football Association, which is also called the AEFA, uh, he, saw, you know, he called a press conference the next day and uh, he, he turned up and uh, basically he said to the, the world's press, I don't take seriously any comment by someone who looks like an enormous scrotum. The head of the Asian Football Association was incensed. He said, I don't look like a scrotum. African elephants look like scrotums. I don't know what the plural of scrotum is. Scrota, maybe? Um, it's not something I should dwell on, I suspect. And uh, the, you know, then the head of the African uh, Elephant uh, Football Association, yeah, he came, it all kicked off. They were practically going to have a fight. So what they decided to do in the end is to call me in to settle the debate. This happens a lot, you know, when there's world problems, they get on the phone to me, they say, Andy, collect us some data, sort it all out. So, that's what I did. Over the course of a, a season of elephant football, I, um, I collected data about how many goals different elephants scored and from which continent they were from. So I had uh, 60, 60 Asian elephants that I tracked throughout the season and 60 African elephants that I tracked throughout the season. So I've got some data a bit like this. So uh, I, obviously I didn't put it all up because there's a lot of it. But essentially we've got a group of Asian elephants and we've got a group of African elephants. And there, there would have been 60, 60 of each. But like I say, I've only I've put a little, little sample up to give you the gist of it. And what I did was across the whole season I measured how many goals they scored. So this Asian elephant, he only scored one goal over the whole season. He was, he was probably a defender, maybe. Um, <coughs> So, uh, you know, anyway, so I've got lots and lots of scores of how many goals they, they scored. And these are the means within the two groups. So the Asian elephants, across the whole season, the average amount of goals that an Asian elephant scored over a season of elephant football was 3.5 goals. For the African elephants, it was slightly higher. It was 4.6 goals. Now, um, this is, uh, these, these means are going to become relevant later on. The thing I want you to notice is if we want to if we want to put a categorical variable into a linear model. So let's say we wanted to, to create a linear model and we wanted to predict the number of goals scored based on something categorical. For example, whether the elephant was from Asia or from Africa. So we've got a very very simple model. We're predicting goals and we're predicting it from two two categories: whether an elephant is uh, an Asian elephant or an African elephant. The way to do that is we need to assign some kind of codes to the groups. So we need to say, uh, you know, because we can't put letters into a linear model, we have to put numbers into it. So we need to assign numbers to the two groups. And one way of doing this, and if you're doing regression, it's, it's quite an important way to do it, is to use zeros and ones. So you use a binary coding. So the only values you're allowed are zero and one. It doesn't particularly matter which way round we do this, but for, uh, for the sake of argument, I have uh, assigned the Asian elephants a code of zero and the African elephants a code of one. So what I'm putting into my linear model, I'm not putting in the words Asian and African, I'm doing the sort of numerical equivalent, which is putting, putting zeros and ones in. So when there's a zero means Asian elephant, when there's a one means African elephant. The other thing I want to draw your attention to at the moment is what the difference between these two means are. So if we took the mean of the African elephants, which is 4.6 and a bit, and subtracted from it the mean of the Asian elephants, which is 3.53, we end up with this value, 1.08. And that's an important value to remember uh, for some of the slides that are coming. So, things to remember at this point, we've got some Asian elephants, we've got some African elephants, We've uh, collected data about how many goals each one of them scores over the season. We know that the average amount of goals scored for an Asian elephant is 3.5. We know that the average amount of goals scored for an African elephant is 4.6. We also know that the difference between those two values is about 1.08. So,
like I said, these values are important, so I'm over-egging the pudding here. <coughs> We've got a difference between the average amount of goals scored by Asian and African ele elephants of 1.08. That's just kind of help you visualise that difference. So if we want to use a linear model in this context, that's fine. We can do it. We can put in categorical variables as predictors in linear models, and that's absolutely fine. When we do, as I said, we have to code the scores. So we have to code the group memberships of the things that we're putting into the linear model. So in this case, we need to code whether it's an African or Asian elephant using, uh, using numbers. Now, in a, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to look at other ways of coding groups. But for the time being, we're going to use a system known as dummy coding. And dummy coding is just this, this use of zeros and ones. Like I said, there are other ways that you can do it, and we're going to look at them later in the course. But for the time being, <coughs> just imagine we can only use zeros and ones. So this is what our model looks like. So we've got a very, very familiar linear model. We've been dealing with this all term so far, so hopefully it's in, ingrained in your mind. So we're predicting an outcome. In this case, that's the number of goals scored. And the little subscript i's mean we're just predicting it for a particular you know, elephant in this case. Um, we're predicting it from a variable x, from a predictor variable, and in this case, our predictor variable, we could replace that x with something that makes more sense to us, like elephant type, so whether it was uh, an Asian or African elephant. So this variable here, as I've already said, can, can be two values. It can be a zero or a one. Zero would mean Asian elephant, one would mean African. Now the question is, what happens to the, uh, the intercept and what happens to the, the gradient, for want of a better word, or the, or the you know, parameter for elephant type. What happens when we use categorical variables? What are these values? What do they represent? So that's what we're going to look at now. But the basic system is the, is the same as everything we've covered before. We've got a linear model, we've got a predictor, just so happens that predictor is categorical. Uh, that's no problem. Uh, providing that we use a sort of a system of co a numerical coding that uh, you know kind of makes sense, if you like. So dummy coding. If we use this dummy coding, this zero one coding, <coughs> what happens to the the intercept or the constant in the model? Well, remember our dummy coding. At the moment, we've coded it this way round. Like I say, that was an arbitrary decision. There's nothing magical about assigning zero to Asian elephants and one to, to African elephants. It's just what I decided to do, and it's, it's no particularly big deal. Um, the question is, what's our outcome going to be if, if, we, uh, if, we, if we take a particular category? Now, the outcomes are going to be, because basically we've got sort of group membership, the thing that the model is going to predict is basically the mean of the group. So uh, in terms of what y, the expected value of y is going to be, it's going to be the mean of each group. So if, it's, uh, if, we, if we were to set elephant type as being Asian, the model is going to predict the mean of the Asian elephant group. So let's look what happens. So when, when elephant is Asian, let's assume we were going to put you know, Asian into the model. So when elephant type is Asian, we know that the variable that we've called elephant type, this is the x in our model, that will be zero. We know that because that's the, that's the way around we chose to code things. What's the predicted number of goals going to be if you're an Asian elephant? Well, basically, it's going to be the mean of that, of that Asian group. So if we look at our equation, we're predicting the number of goals we're predicting it from the type of elephant we have. And the question I asked a little while ago was, what happens, you know, what, what's the deal with these beta values? Well, let's try plugging some of the numbers in. So first of all, if we're looking at Asian elephants, then elephant type becomes zero. So this value here of elephant type, we can replace with a zero. And that has the uh, convenient effect of, of cancelling this whole bit of the model out. I also said, well, what are we going to predict if we know that you know, an elephant is Asian? What's, our sort of, what's the best prediction we're going to have? Because we're dealing with groups, the best prediction we can have is the group mean, essentially. So this outcome will be the mean of the group that we're dealing with. And remember, we're just looking at Asian elephants now. So our outcome is the mean of the Asian elephant group. So that means 
By putting, a, uh, by putting an elephant type as zero, which is, represents Asian elephants, we get rid of that, we can scrub that out of the equation, and uh, that leaves us with just the intercept. So the intercept is going to be equal to the mean of the Asian elephant group. Now more generally than that, when we use this system of coding, uh, the, uh, the intercept, the, the, the value of the outcome uh, when the predictor is zero, is going to be the mean of whichever group we coded as zero. So because we coded Asian elephants as zero, the intercept or the, the, the constant in the model will be the mean of that group that we coded as zero. So basically, beta zero is the mean of the Asian elephant group. So how do we find out what beta 1 is going to represent? So the, you know, the gradient, if you like, we can talk about gradients because we've only got one predictor. Well, we can do uh, the opposite now and look at African elephants. So we say, what's the model going to give us if we make a prediction about African elephants? So what happens to the variables in the model? Well, we know African elephants we coded as 1, not 0. So our variable elephant type will be the value 1 rather than the value 0. Also, what are we going to predict if we know that an elephant is an African elephant? What's, what's our sort of best prediction that we can have about the number of goals they scored? Again, because we're dealing with groups, our best prediction will be the mean of that group. So our predicted outcome, the predicted number of goals we should get from the model, will be the mean of the African elephant group. So we can look at our linear model again. So. Uh, you know, as before, we're predicting the number of goals. We're predicting it from a single categorical predictor, which is the type of elephant. We've got these beta values in. And now we're dealing with African elephants, our outcome. So we can replace goals with our predicted value. Our predicted value will be the mean of the African group. Elephant type, because we're dealing with African elephants now, and we coded African elephants with a 1. <coughs> that elephant type variable will be a 1. So once we plug those sort of values in, what do we end up with? Well, we end up with uh, our predicted outcome is the mean of the African elephant group, and we got beta 1 and beta 0 sitting around. Now, the thing is, we already know what beta 0 represents. We just did that on the previous slide. And it represented the mean of the Asian elephant group. So what we can do is replace this beta 0 with the mean of the Asian elephant group. So then our linear models become, well, our outcome is, uh, is the mean of the African elephant group. We've got this kind of gradient or coefficient that we don't really know what it represents yet. And we've got our beta 0, which is the mean of the Asian elephant group. Now all we have to do to work out what beta 1 represents is to jiggle that equation around a bit. So essentially what we do is we bring this over to the other side of the equal sign. So we want to get beta 1 on its own, and to do that we bring this over. And when we bring it over, uh, it becomes negative, because we're switching the side of it. So essentially we bring this over here, so we'll get the mean of the African elephant group minus the mean of the Asian elephant group, and uh, that's what's written down the bottom. So beta 1, the gradient if you like, is going to represent the difference between the two group means. So, when you have a categorical predictor with two categories, um, and you use this kind of zero one dummy coding uh, to, to, to sort of specify your groups, you end up with a linear model, just like every other linear model that we've been dealing with, but uh, the beta zero and the beta one have kind of a, well, it's not really a special meaning, but they, they have a specific, a specific interpretation. So the beta zero is going to be the mean of the base, what we call the baseline group. So that's the group you coded with a zero, essentially. And the beta one, the gradient, is going to represent the difference between those two means. So let's have a look at this graphically, uh, which might hopefully make a bit more sense. So uh, these dots represent all the scores for our Asian elephants. And these dots represent all the data points for the African elephants. So uh, we've got, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure the drawery thing is working today. We'll give it a go though. Oh, there you go. So remember, Asian elephants are coded with a zero and African elephants are coded with a one. So this is our model. This is the model that we're fitting to the data. So these dots are the raw scores. 
uh, uh, from both groups respectively. Now, if you think about when we've talked about linear models, we've talked about uh, you know what the what the intercept or what beta zero represents, what the constant represents, and it represents the value of the outcome when the predictor is zero. So, if you look here, when the predictor is zero, when we're dealing with Asian elephants. What's the predicted value? Well, it's the mean of the Asian elephant group. So that's what that red dotted line is. So when our predict is zero, we get a value of uh, goals scored, which is equal to the mean of that group. So that's the square there. So our intercept, our constant, is going to be 3.533, which, remember, is the mean of the elephant, uh, the Asian elephant group. When we look at African elephants, our predicted value is the mean of that group. That's the, the black square there. And uh, that, just to remind you, is in line with that dotted line, which is 4.617. So these black dots are the two means of the group. So we end up, our linear model, when we use this 0, 1 coding, we end up with a, an intercept that represents the, the baseline, the, the mean of the baseline group. And if we join the two means, together, the gradient of that line, it's still a linear model, it's still a straight line, the gradient of that line will be the difference between those two means, so it will be 1.08. So this is essentially what we're fitting. So even though we're dealing with categories, and it might seem counterintuitive that you can have a linear model sort of between categories, you, actually, you can. There's nothing inconsistent with this at all. So the... <clears throat> you, know, the, the, you get a linear model by connecting two means, essentially. You get a straight line. <coughs> so, you can put you know, categorical predictors in. If you put categorical predictors with two categories in, SPSS will happily code them as 0 and 1 for you. You, don't even, you can put any code you want into SPSS and it will recode it as 0 and 1. So if you wanted to put, say, gender in as a predictor, no problem at all. SPSS will just deal with it for you and uh, convert it into zeros and ones. If you wanted to put you know, any, any other uh, category with two categories in, it's no problem at all. So we can fit linear models using categorical predictors. That's no problem at all. The, the linear model generally is a very flexible system. In this example, we can fit a linear model predicting the goals scored as the outcome and the type of elephant as a categorical predictor. The things to note is when we use this kind of dummy coding, when we use zeros and ones to code the groups, the intercept will be the mean of the group that we gave a zero code to. <coughs> and the beta for the, it's what's known as a dummy variable, but the, the beta for the, the zero one variable uh, will be the difference between the two group means. And we can prove this. So this is a, this is a, a regression that I did on these data. Uh, so uh, we had elephants coded, or I had elephants coded as zero and one, and I had the number of goals scored as my outcome variable. This was just a, uh, like a, a simple linear regression done in SPSS, predicting goals from this categorical variable of elephants. And lo and behold, in our coefficients table, so when we look at the betas, the constant, so that's beta zero, is in fact 3.533, which is what I said it would be. It's the mean of the the group that I coded as zero. It's the the mean of the um, Asian elephant group. And if we look at the beta value for the predictor, so the beta value associated with the variable type of elephant, again, lo and behold, it's 1.08. It's the difference between the two means. Now, the important thing is here, if you think about it, uh, when we've de dealt with other linear models, we test this beta against zero. So when we, this t-test up here, what that's testing is whether, whether the, the beta value associated with a predictor is zero. And remember, a beta of zero is flat, basically. It's a flat line, no difference at all. So what this t-test tests is whether the difference between means or whether this beta is zero. You may remember in first year that there was another way of uh, testing whether two means were different from each other or were actually zero. And what was that? What test did you use to compare means? T-test. It was very quiet and subdued, but absolutely correct. Fantastic. You used the T-test. Uh, and what do we use in regression to test whether this beta is different from zero? Bugger me, it's the T-test. 
So what's going on is exactly the same. We're using a, a t-statistic to test whether this beta is zero or not. But this, when we use a categorical predictor, that beta represents the difference between means. So this is absolutely no different whatsoever to you know, going through the menus and, and doing a t-test. So, you may be familiar, or last year, uh, if you did research skills, you would have been taught about doing t-tests to compare <coughs> the difference between two means. The t-test, in the, in the context in which you learnt it last year, is a special case of this linear model that we've, uh, I've been trying to teach you about for the last however many weeks it is. It's a special case of it. The, the linear model is a, is a much more general, flexible system, and essentially, you know, you can do lots of lots of different things with it. But I just want to demonstrate that, regardless of, I mean, it's easier if you wanted to test the difference between two means. It's much easier to operationalize in SPSS by going through the t-test menu. But there's no reason why you can't run it as a regression, you know, with a, a sort of a dummy coded predictor, and the results you get will be the same. And this really it goes. Back to, I don't know if you remember, I think it was the first lecture of the module, where um, I gave you some example about zombies uh, eating brains in a canteen, and was showing you that you could do lots and lots and lots of different types of tests and basically get the same result. That's because all those tests were part of this linear model that I've been teaching you about. And so although you tend to think about regression in a very specific way, and you think about it as, you know, testing whether, you know, variables predict other variables or whatever, there's no reason why you can't use it to test differences between means. So um, here's a t-test of the same data. So this is the elephant data again. Uh, but this time I ran it through a t-test in SPSS. Uh, and uh, so you get the difference between the means. is Again, it's 1.08. Uh, we get a t-statistic value of 3.17, etc., etc., etc. Significance 0.02, uh, 0.002. And let's have a look again at the regression output. This is the same as what was on the previous slide. Uh, so we've got mean difference of 1.08. That corresponds to the beta value for the, for the predictor when we ran it as regression. The T statistic that tests whether this beta is different from zero is 3.17. Lo and behold, that's exactly the same. Maybe, maybe I should see the, the I'll, I'll draw. This could go wrong. Uh, so the T statistics we get exactly the same in the two outputs so even though we've sort of you know we've operationalized it differently exactly the same stuff's going on uh, the significance value of whether that that beta is uh, significantly different from zero is exactly the same as the significance value for if we you know do it do a t test of the difference between the means uh, and what was the, the thing we've already looked at? So the, the difference between means is the same as the beta. So, oh, and the other thing probably worth mentioning, if you look at the confidence interval, surprise, surprise, that's exactly the same too. So the point I want, to, want you to take away from this is not... Uh, is, is basically that the, the linear model is a very flexible system. So we can put categorical predictors in. When we do put categorical predictors in, and we use this kind of dummy coding using zeros and ones, which is kind of the, the standard thing that you do, um, it's basically, it's no different to doing a t-test. In fact, it's exactly the same as doing a t-test. Uh, you know, if you want to be literal about it, the maths behind the, the two things are slightly different in a way. Uh, but you, you end up with exactly the same result. So the, the T in regression that's, that's testing this, uh, whether this parameter is different from zero, is the exact same T you would get from running a t-test to compare the differences between means. So categorical predictors are not a problem for the linear model. And this is the other, the other reason why you may have thought it's kind of odd that I tend to try not to talk about regression. I always refer to the linear model, and that's because regression has a very specific connotation. People tend to think about regression in a very specific way, and that you know you 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 use it to look for predictors of outcome variables and things like that. And they tend to then think, well, you can't use regression to test differences between means because you know that's just wrong and and that that's quite an ingrained idea. So that's why I tend not to talk about regression, I talk about the linear model, because I'm trying to kind of get you out of thinking about 
thinking about things in that sort of way. So the linear model basically is very, very flexible. You can put categorical predictors in. It's no problem at all. But when you do, effectively what you end up doing is looking at differences between means. But it's, a, it's the same system. It's the same, you know, everything that we've learned up till now, you can still carry that forward and, uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about looking at differences between means. Now, I'm not going to get into this too much because this is what we're getting into in uh, next week's lecture. But I just want to flag the fact that to try and keep things simple, I've used uh, uh, an example of a categorical variable with only two categories. But there's absolutely no reason why you can't extend this idea to categorical variables that have several categories. Now, how you operationalize it, if you were actually going to do it kind of through the regression menus, is more complicated, so you don't end up doing it through the regression menus. But that what SPSS is doing behind the scenes is, uh, is the same as if you were to do this as a regression. So if you have more than three, uh, sorry, more than two categories, so let's imagine we wanted to uh, look across species. So rather than having a debate about whether Asian elephants were better than African elephants at football, maybe uh, we looked at an example of whether, say, elephants were better than uh, lions. Is it lions? I think, yeah, lions. Elephants are better than lions, and whether they're better than humans. So, um, frankly, after the display I witnessed last night, I'd, I'd, I'd probably rather see a, a pack of lions uh, on the field at the stadium that I was at, which I don't want to mention in case there are any Tottenham supporters here, because they'll kill me. Um, anyway, so um, maybe we want to look at sort of across, across species. So are elephants better than lions? Are lions better than humans? So we, then we've got three categories now. So it gets more complicated, but you can still, like I said, I'm going to get into this uh, next week in more detail. So I don't want to dwell on it particularly, but we can still code multiple categories and put them into a regression. <coughs> but if we use this dummy coding system, uh, what happens is we basically end up with more than one predictor. So what we can't do is put elephant, lion, and human into a regression model as a single predictor. We can't do that at all. What we have to do, what goes on behind the scenes, is that gets broken down into two predictors. And these two predictors will represent uh, differences between uh, these categories. And it again, it depends how we code it. So you'd have to decide on some kind of baseline category. So we might decide our baseline is humans. Let's say you know, we just want to compare sort of non-humans to humans. Um, so we'd end up with one variable that basically represents the difference between humans and elephants. So humans are our baseline, so they get coded as zero for everything. They're just they're zero. Humans are zeros across the board. And what changes is which category gets assigned a one. So our first variable, maybe we assign the elephants a one. So this, this will literally be like a column in SPSS if you were going to do it this way, which you, you wouldn't. In, you just, you'd go through a, a different menu. But if you were going to do it as a regression, you'd have a column of ones and zeros where uh, you put a one every time there's an elephant and you put a zero every time there's a human. Then you have another column uh, which specified humans versus lions and there uh, the lions get a one and everything else gets a zero. Now the effect of using this coding, so if you put both of these variables in at the same time, so you, you have to kind of force them into the regression at the same point in time, and what these two variables are doing are coding these three categories, but coding it across two variables. So you end up with one variable that will represent basically humans versus elephants. So the, the human category has zero for everything. So the one versus zero here represents humans versus elephants. And the other one will represent um, humans, humans versus lions, because the lions have got a one. So this is known as a, as a dummy coding scheme. So the reason it's called dummy coding is because you're creating, so you, you want to use this as a sort of categorical predictor, but you're having to create these sort of dummy variables or these uh, you know, sort of fake variables, if you like, that, that code these different groups from each other. So like I said, more on this next week, but I just, I just want to sort of flag the idea that this linear model, you can, you can put in uh, predictors that have multiple categories. That's no problem at all, uh, but you end up having to specify them across uh, sort of more than one predictor, essentially. Like I said, more on that later. So assuming you believe me that uh, categorical predictors can go into linear models and that's all fine, and uh, like I said, we'll, we'll expand on that next week. 
The other thing I want to talk about is moderation. And moderation is quite an important concept in psychology generally. We, we, a lot of the research that we do essentially relies on hypotheses that are testing moderation. We don't always know actually that we're testing moderation uh, even when we are. So all moderation means is that when you imagine you have a relationship between two variables. So uh, for example, we had a relationship between uh, which continent an elephant came from and uh, how many goals they scored. A moderating variable would be a variable that changes that relationship in some way. So, um, you know, in, so you've got this relationship between what type of elephant you are and how many goals you score. Imagine if that relationship was different if they were playing in uh, kind of warm climates compared to if they were playing you know, in, in the rain, for example. So it may be the case that the, the relationship between what type of elephant you are and how many goals you score is affected by the weather conditions that you're playing in. That's essentially what moderation is. So a moderator variable is a variable that changes the size or maybe even the direction of the relationship between two other variables. So we'll, we'll look at uh, an example to try and sort of make this, make this clearer. <laughs> Uh, I thought I really thought you'd be getting bored of me rambling on now, so I've got another video. So the example is um, based around the the, uh, the idea of whether video games are bad for you. So if this works, which is not going to. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Sorry. It's this bloody smart pen thing. These smart pens ruin everything. You're going to love this video, won't it? No, I don't want to. I don't want to do it. Um, hey. What do you say, guys? You can just, you can just hang outside in the sun all day, passing the ball around. to find the only bit of South Park that didn't have any swearing in it. <laughs> um, so are video games bad for you? Um, there's, uh, basically, if you look at Ofcom statistics, uh, about two-thirds of uh, kind of like eight to 15-year-olds in this country own a video game console. So they're quite widespread. Uh, that proportion is even higher in boys. About, um, I think it's about 88% of boys aged between sort of seven and 15 own a video console. So... Uh, they're, you know, they're used a lot. And there's been a fair bit of research done on whether playing violent video games actually makes you aggressive. Um, and, uh, well, I, you, I was reading up on this when I, I used this example in the book chapter. And uh, I was quite horrified because I was trying to... A lot of the, re a lot of the research uh, <laughs> focuses on specific games. So there's a game called Manhunt or something. I'm going to show my age now because this all means nothing to me. Uh, there's a game called Manhunt and another one called Mad World or something. So I was kind of looking around at what these games were because I kept reading about them thinking, what are they like then? And I, I don't have a games console. Um, so I was looking on the internet and they're horrific. They really are. Uh, so lifelike as you bludgeon people to death. Um, anyway, so some of this research has kind of uh, suggested that playing violent video games actually makes you violent. So you could uh, have a look at this. Now the interesting thing is whether there's some kind of moderation <coughs> variable. So is it a straightforward relationship that the more you use video games, the more aggressive you become? Or is there something that uh, moderates that relationship? Is there something that affects it? And um, one of the things that may affect it is because you, uh, in ex externalizing disorders, uh, like conduct problems, um, you, you tend to get aggressive behavior. So conduct problems are kind of uh, a predictor of uh, aggressive behaviour anyway so video games 
you know, kind of feed into that. Maybe it's the case that if, you're, if you kind of have a conduct disorder or uh, something that is a risk factor for a conduct disorder, the effect of the video game will be more powerful. So one of the things you can measure is callous unemotional traits, which is a risk factor for uh, externalizing problems and conduct problems. And it's basically, callous unemotional traits are things like a lack of empathy or sort of using people for your own personal gain, um, that sort of thing. So it's kind of like, a, it's like a, it's a bit like psychopathy in a way, but kind of, you know, scaled back, because it's only a risk factor for stuff. It's, you're, not, you're not that bad, but uh, you're just sort of, like I say, lacking emotion and, and uh, empathy and things like that. So, how will we look at this as a moderator? Well, the, the sort of theoretical model, the best way to dis, sort of describe uh, what moderation actually means is through a diagram like this. So, as I say, you've got a relationship between two variables. So, we'd be predicting that video game use has an impact on your aggressive behaviour. So, there's a, a, a relationship there, like a, you know, a correlation, or you, you put in a regression and the beta is significant. What a moderator is doing is having an impact on that relationship. So it's feeding into this relationship somehow. So we'd be arguing that callous unemotional traits are somehow influencing the strength or direction of that relationship. So the, the simplest way to think about this is imagine that we could split callous unemotional traits into two groups. So uh, this just makes it a bit easier to think about. So you've got a group of people who are callous and a group of people who are not callous. What moderation implies is that you get a sort of a different relationship in the two groups. So for those who uh, do not have callous unemotional traits, we might, for example, get no relationship at all. We get a completely flat line, so there's no relationship. doesn't matter how many hours you play video games, your aggressive tendencies never change. But if you have callous unemotional traits, if you're kind of in this other group, then there's a positive relationship. The more hours you play video games, the higher your aggression levels get. So this diagram represents a very simple case of moderation. So no effect in one group, uh, a strong effect in the other group. But it doesn't have to be quite, moderation doesn't have to be as pronounced as this, but essentially this is, this is, what, it, it, this is what it is. Now, if we don't look at callous unemotional traits as a sort of categorical variable, if we look at it measured continuously, we get the same principle, it just, it's a, you get a bit more of a complicated graph. So this side represents no moderation at all. So basically, this is video games, so how long you play video games for, this is uh, how much aggression you have. So you can see there's kind of like a slightly positive relationship here. So uh, as the amount of video game playing goes up, so does the predicted level of aggression. But we've also got our callous emotional traits variable along here. And you can think of this, this is low, low levels of callous unemotional traits and this is high level of callous unemotional traits. So I've, I've put some labels here. So what we see is that this relationship, so this kind of slightly upward trend uh, for playing more video games and getting more aggressive, doesn't change as you become higher in your callous unemotional traits. So even though we're measuring this continuously, it's a, it's a similar principle. It's just saying this relationship is pretty static, no matter what your level of callous unemotional traits are. This, however, would be uh, a case of moderation. So this illustrates moderation. And uh, I've, you know, I've kind of hammed it up. I've, I've made it a bit extreme here. But essentially, at low levels of callous unemotional traits, there's a negative relationship. So the more video games you play, the less aggressive you get. And that's completely counterintuitive, but like I say, I was trying to make it an extreme example. So we get a, a negative relationship for low levels of callous unemotional traits, but as callous unemotional traits get higher, that relationship becomes less negative. It's sort of, so that arrow's flattened out a bit compared to that one. And then at high levels of callous unemotional traits, the relationship sort of flips on its head. It actually becomes positive. So at high levels of callous unemotional traits, so when we're up here on the continuum, the relationship between video games and, and uh, aggression is actually going upwards. So again, just look at the arrows reflect the direction of the relationship between playing video games and being aggressive. Starts off negative, goes sort of slightly less negative and then ends up positive. So this would be an example of moderation. The relationship between video gaming and aggression is changing as a, as a function of, of how uh, callous you are, essentially. This is non-moderation because 
you're, however callous you are, is not basically changing the relationship between video gaming and aggression. So how do we test this statistically? Well, basically, uh, you won't be surprised to know, you can use a linear model again. Uh, so you'd have some kind of outcome, you'd have your two uh, predictors, and also the in, what's known as the interaction between the two. So in this case, our outcome would be uh, aggression, and we'd be predicting it from uh, the predictor variable, which is uh, how, much, how long you spend playing video games, the moderator variable, which is how callous you are on a continuous scale, and also those two variables multiplied together, which is known as an interaction term. So it, it's, it's one variable times the other. In terms of what the linear model looks like, you just end up, you know, we, we've seen we can just add in predictors and we give them beta values. You end up with, uh, uh, this, is, this is this model, but as an equation, aggression. You've still got your intercept uh, predicted from ga how much gaming you have. That will have a beta associated with it. How callous you are, that will have a beta associated with it. And again, an interaction term, which like I said, it's just it's these two variables multiplied together. And uh, obviously there'll be some error. So moderation is uh, represented by an interaction in a linear model. And an interaction term is literally the two variables multiplied together. It's the, uh, that's known as the product of the two variables. So if you wanted to do this manually, you could literally just uh, go into the, uh, you know, wh when we were transforming data, uh, we used the compute function. You could use the, the compute function in the transform menu. Uh, to, to, to just literally times the t create a new variable timesing the two predictors together. <laughs> and if that interaction term is significant, then you have a significant moderation effect. So in a way, it's really quite straightforward. And again, the reason I'm flagging all of this here is because when we start talking about experimental designs, we're going to talk about interactions a lot. And I'm, I'm just sort of using this as a as a way into that really so that you understand that when you see an interaction term you're, you're basically testing this, this idea of moderation. So here's some output from this particular example. Uh, so we've got, I know it looks a bit different to your usual SPSS output but that's because I did it in a special way. Uh, so we've got our outcomes aggression and our predictors are the constant so that's the beta zero We've got our moderator variable, the callous unemotional traits. We've got uh, amount of time spent video gaming. And then this is this interaction term. Uh, you can see down here, it tells you that the interaction is literally video gaming times callous unemotional traits. So the question is, is this significant? Um, because this p-value is less than 0.05, it is. So this is an example in this data set of where you would say there's significant moderation. So although video gaming predicts aggression, Callous unemotional traits predicts aggression. Callous unemotional traits also it moderates the relationship between video gaming and aggression. So how do we pick apart what this interaction means? Well, you can use something called uh, simple slopes analysis, which basically breaks down the relationship between uh, video gaming and predicted aggression based on whether, it sort of breaks into groups a bit, so it's sort of whether callous unemotional traits are low, medium or high. So these three lines, I know the top line's not very clear at all, uh, but these three lines represent, in order, low callous unemotional traits, medium levels and high levels. And you can see this is very similar to the other kind of graph that I put up. So the relationship between aggr uh, aggression and video gaming is slightly negative to begin with. If you're, if you're low on callous traits, if you're sort of in the middle range of callous traits, it's fairly flat, and there's only actually a positive relationship between video gaming and aggression uh, when you're high on callous unemotional traits as well. So this will be very important because if you were trying to make general claims about video gaming being bad for you, uh, I should say these data are made up, so don't think this is actually what's going on in the real world. Uh, I don't know whether it is or not, I just made it up. Uh, but if you were, you know, if you were sort of trying to get some policy about or some advice about video gaming being bad uh, in terms of aggression. Well, what this is basically telling you is it's only bad if you happen to you know, have a child who's already uh, sort of callous and, and unemotional. If you're, if you're low on callous unemotional traits, video gaming won't do you any harm. So it, it's, like, it's a really important concept, actually. 
So what have we learned today? Well, I hope that you've learned that the linear model is a very flexible system. You can include categorical predictors, and hopefully if you get that, that will help you next week when we start looking at experimental designs. You can include them uh, and use this dummy coding thing, so coding variables with zeros and ones. If you're using categorical predictors, the betas in your model end up representing the differences between means. So when we come to look at experimental designs, it just shows you that this is a framework that we can use for comparing uh, the means of groups. And uh, you know, that it, will, it all fits in nicely. And finally, we had a look at this, this idea of an interaction or a, a moderating variable. So this is a variable that affects the relationship between two other variables. And we test it by looking for these interactions between variables, so it's sort of uh, one variable multiplied by the other. Okay, so next week we're going to move on to sort of more experimental designs, and uh, obviously, good luck all of you in your exercises this week. Uh, hope it hope it goes well.